Another example is Lincoln County, Wyoming, where the following various species were found. Herring, pickerel, deep sea bass. How many deep sea bass you think the fishermen in Wyoming ever catch? 1890, an alligator was found. How many of those do you think are found in Wyoming? They only live down in Louisiana and Florida. And then one final thing were palm leaves that were eight feet long. Palm trees don't grow in Wyoming anymore. And wherever they grow, they aren't eight feet long. Now I'm going to show you some pictures here of some more of these hard part remains prehistoric animal remains. This is the Trochodon, which was the most prevalent dinosaur in North America. So you're more familiar with Brontosaurus and some of the other names, but if you want to know what was the most prevalent dinosaur in North America, it was the Trochodon, known as the duckbill dinosaur, because very similar to duckbill platypus, which lives in Australia, the monotreme, the egg-laying mammal, duckbill platypus, he has a duckbill. And it's estimated that the trochodon was as prevalent as the deer is today in North America. How'd you like to go hunting for the trochodon? Duckbill dinosaur, they were as prevalent for those out in the other room. You have to carry binoculars out there. <laughs> There's an idea. You can sit out there with binoculars and see what's going on. As prevalent as common deer is in North America. Then, now we've shown you some about Beresofka, so you know what the mammoths look like. Let's see which one of those is the most interesting. I guess both of them. Here is a prehistoric fossil shark. A man is sitting inside of his jaws. Now the other picture on the other page is uh, one of the giant birds. A bird that was 10 feet tall, had a wingspan of 20 feet. Looked like a miniature airplane in the air. That's literally true. Largest bird today only has a wingspan of around 10 feet. The condor, about 10 feet. So that's double that distance in the spread of his wings. And it would look like a glider in the air. But this is a, fo this is a fossil remain of a shark. Now, sharks just don't grow that big. That's a whole man sitting inside of his jaw. Now, what's even better than that is the turtle the giant sea turtle remains, and of course the man, I guess, is about half the height of the length of the turtle. Now you can see that's not plaster Paris, that's the original thing. And that is a turtle. You know what the box turtle looks like. You see him out in your backyard, this is a turtle. Now a sea turtle, granted, but nevertheless a turtle's a turtle. They can't grow the size of a hippopotamus. <laughs> Now, uh, I don't know what the, or the other creatures, one of those crosses between a, a shark and an eel or a shark and a snake that was a ferocious type dinosaur in the sea. There are a lot of other pictures here, but we've already looked at a lot of those in the past. So those are some hard part remains of these tremendous creatures that lived at one time. Remember, the fossils that we found represent not only most of our modern species, but many, many extinct species that, of course, are no longer with us. And the fossils that represent extinct species, especially those that have become extinct, say, over a thousand years ago and all the time prior to that, generally represent, most of the time, represent animals or plants that are just tremendous in size in comparison to any of these small uh, remains of that particular family or species that we have today. Not the particular family, but maybe the species of that. Take, for instance, just that palm tree. We're talking about fruit that is unre of an unreal size. We're talking about apples that would maybe grow the size of a small pumpkin or a watermelon because everything was larger there. The conditions were better. And every, the, you see, growth has been stunted since then. Growth in animals has been stunted. Perhaps growth in people has been stunted. There were giants in those days. And although occasionally you'll find an eight-foot person today, they're very, very rare. You don't have a plurality of them like the Gibberim and Nephilim that you have in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. 
And so, yeah, he has. And so a lot of these, these things that we have as far as their remains are concerned are just tremendous in comparison to what we have today. All right, a fifth type of fossil remain is the fossils of petrification, where an entire tree has been dislodged from its location carried somewhere in water and buried with the right minerals, with the right sediment. And today we still don't understand exactly what took place in the ancient process of uh, petrification because it's not happening today. By that, of course, we mean the petrification of wood, the turning of wood into solid stone. Not an appearance like stone, but the turning of wood into solid stone. And the only reasonable explanation is that this also took place during the flood and certain types of trees, especially some of the great ones of the past, were buried in sediment. You see, a lot of things would have been left unburied in sediment. Of course, they wouldn't remain today. But those things that were buried in sediment, that were buried in the right place with the right minerals around them that would help in some process of metamorphism where the, even the bark on the tree has been preserved but changed into stone. Now I've got some examples of this because um, we one time on a family vacation took a trip out to California and I got a, a picture or two. Be careful with them as they go around. This first one back in the 60s is amazing and it's of course the petrified forest in Arizona. Now you look in the background and you can just see hundreds and hundreds and this is a forest of many, many square miles, and it happens to be here in one little particular location that's perhaps more famous than any other area, where you've got huge remains of the trunks and the limbs of trees all turned to solid stone. So be careful with that as it goes around. You can pass that around to those that can see it. No comments on what I looked like back then or the family because <laughs> that was back a long time ago. I was just a little boy then. Now this was near there, another thing that evidently was caused by the flood, the Painted Desert. This is just a picture of some of the material that uh, had been extracted from the desert and made into a building. But I remember in driving across there, the Painted Desert, you look out and everywhere you look, it's blue and orange and red and yellow. All the stones are all different colors, just like someone spilled a bucket of paint. You know, Pittsburgh paints poured over the top of them. <laughs> and turn it all different colors. Now that's just a small representation of what you can see there. Now these remains of uh, petrified wood are found not only there, but they're found in Yellowstone National Park. They're found a great place is in Cairo, Egypt, where you again have huge remains. A certain valley in California, again you have huge remains of petrified wood that has been found. Got some examples here that probably most of you have seen. But what's interesting about this, this is a piece of petrified wood and you can see the bark and everything is still on it. That you think about this when you hold it, because I've thought about it many times, that you're holding a tree that was alive whenever Noah was on the earth. That's how old this is. And that's how old all those logs there are. You're holding a tree that was standing wherever it was standing, perhaps in California, that's where a lot of the sequoias are now, or wherever it was, Yellowstone in Egypt. You see, Egypt didn't used to be a desert like it is today, much vegetation growing there. But you're actually holding something that was alive in Noah's day. Now, it's not every day you get an opportunity to have something that was here in Noah's day. There are some other examples. Now this was taken out of the middle of a rock. Uh, you can't see the bark on it, but you can see the different colors into which it was turned. But that again, that looks like a rock to you. But that's a piece of wood though. Now leaves, things like that of course didn't remain except as imprints, but the very limbs with the very bark on the tree has remained. That first piece I passed around will show that. A smaller piece you can also see some of the bark on shows the same thing. Petrification.
difficult to explain unless you're going to accept what the Bible has said about the flood, and it did have the ability to uproot these trees and bury them in just the right place so that we'd still have them preserved today. Now, we'll say more about petrified wood when we get at a later point. And a final type of fossil is a fossil that comes by the process of carbonization. Now, in carbonization, you have the disappearance of hydrogen and oxygen, leaving you with only carbon, which is what takes place in the process of the formation of coal. The extraction of hydrogen and oxygen, leaving you carbon, which is what coal is made out of. Now, there's an estimated 7 trillion tons much of which has never been discovered and never tapped yet, seven trillion tons of coal buried in the earth, found everywhere, even as far away as Antarctica, petrified wood as well as coal. Vast amounts of petrified wood and coal have been found in Antarctica. Now, coal we know is formed by a process of metamorphism where the remains of a plant with the right temperature, the right pressure, and the right amount of time is able to have the hydrogen, the oxygen extracted from it, leaving only carbon. And with the right pressure, with the right temperature, with the right period of time, of course, several thousand years, then your plant remains are allowed to turn into what we know today as coal. Now, the number one theory concerning the formation of coal is known as the peat bog theory, which states that coal is formed by the accumulation of various levels of peat in bogs such as the Dismal Swamp in Virginia. However, as long as we have been investigating the Dismal Swamp in Virginia, there has only been an accumulation of seven feet of peat in the bog in the swamp, in the dismal swamp in Virginia. Only seven feet of peat. And a good, respectable seam of coal, they're measured in different seams. You dig down so deep and find a seam, and once you work your way through that seam, that's all there is. Uh, a good seam of coal is between 30 and 40 feet thick. Now, in order to get that, you have to have hundreds and hundreds of feet of vegetation in order so that, you see, you're extracting a lot from them, hydrogen and oxygen, and you're reducing their size and their volume. So you have to have hundreds and hundreds of feet of vegetation so that whenever you're through extracting the hydrogen and the oxygen, you end up with a respectable seam of coal, whether it's 10 feet or 20 feet or a good seam of 30 to 40 feet. Now, that's how coal is formed. If you want to say it's formed by peat bog theory, since we know the Earth hasn't been here hundreds of millions of years, and the Dismal Swamp is the best place for peat being formed and laying down in layers, we've only got seven feet of it there. That wouldn't even form an inch of coal. You've got to have hundreds of feet of vegetation. Again, what does this point to? A tremendous amount of vegetation in the pre-flood world. And you've got to have it buried, and of course the flood is what does this, in water, buried with sediments, and over a process of several thousand years, then lo and behold we end up with our great seams of coal that of course aren't that important today, but were so important last century. Now another thing that we can discuss with the time we have left under coal is its kinsman petroleum. Petroleum has been known to exist for hundreds of years because of accidental discoveries that were made, as well as seepage around the Caspian Sea. Now, by accidental discovery, someone just poked a stick too deep in the ground. You know, some oil pockets are that shallow. Most of them that shallow have already been found and tapped into by now, but there have been accidental discoveries where you'd poke something you know, you'd be digging for even for a well. Now, a well 30 feet deep, that's not very deep. And you might be going down 30 feet deep and hit oil, but the problem was no one knew what to do with oil. All it is is a sticky, oily, gooey mess. 
and people were using coal for all their heating purposes and so forth in the past. And it wasn't until 1859 when the first oil well was drilled here in this country. Now that's just a little over a century ago. It was because at that time we found out how important oil was, and of course it has only escalated since that time. What's it caused by? It's caused by not plant remains, but animal remains. The oil, I mean every animal, every person has oil in their body. The oil from hundreds of billions of animals and people, by the way, when you're pumping some gas in, you might be pumping a person into your tank next time, so I hope no one passes out over the thought. Where'd all of it come from? You see, it's been proven that uh, oil was something that was not here at the very beginning because of the process of seepage. Oil, you see, you put oil in the water, and what does oil do? Oil always rises to the top. It has a certain quality about it. It always goes up in anything. And if it had been here hundreds and millions and billions of years, it would have already worked its way by its process of seepage all the way up to the very surface. That didn't take place, though. In other words, it had to be buried sometime subsequent to creation. God didn't create oil and petroleum. It wasn't created. It was something that was formed along with coal as a result of the flood. What's interesting about that is to see how the 20th century and the 19th century were already foreseen by God. And here you've got man digging for coal. You see, coal, it takes such a tremendous volume in comparison to petroleum. That's why coal is passed off the scene. And it's difficult to burn. It leaves a lot of uh, residue in the air. Not that gasoline doesn't, but coal more. It's a filthy thing to work with. And you have to have so much of it. But it's interesting that that has all already been foreseen and foreknown, that 20th century man would pretty soon get bright enough to discover oil and figure out what to do with it. And so it doesn't matter where you are whenever you're pumping that gas into your car at the filling station, you're pumping a brontosaurus into the tank. That's right. They can't explain any other way that oil originated except from the remains of animals. Now, they don't believe it was a quick burial by the flood. But remember, we've got, again, hundreds of millions and billions of animals and humans. Humans have oil in them just like animals do. I know it's a little sadistic to think about that you're pumping a person into your gas tank, but nonetheless, that's what's taking place. Some of those old wicked people that didn't believe Noah's report, they got turned into petroleum. That's what happens to people when they don't believe God. You get burned up and burned up literally. Yes, yeah, see, they'll, they'll get it in the lake of fire, but they're getting it in our car before they get there. Now, that, <laughs> that doesn't take into consideration all of the huge dinosaurs. You get a lot of oil from brontosaurus. And so with all of these dinosaurs, not only the size, but the sheer volume of the creatures, as well as man himself, 15-foot men that lived in the past, then you've got a good source for all of this oil, all of this petroleum. And look now, all of, all of Israel's uh, immediate future is bound up in oil as far as the uh, human aspect of it is concerned. Her whole future is bound up in oil. Because here she is, no oil wells to speak of in Palestine. But why is it you find them all around Palestine, but you don't find them in Palestine? It's going to be very interesting in the last day. See, it gives Israel, it's going to give her more of an opportunity to put her trust in the Lord rather than in her neighbors and make some compromise with her neighbors because they could give her all the oil she wanted as long as she'd just say, all right, I cease to be Israel. We'll let the PLO take over. Well... All Israel has to do is just kind of assimilate herself right into the peoples around her and become a nobody, and no one would be concerned about Israel anymore. But why is it Israel doesn't have any oil wells? See, Israel has to get her oil from other places just like we do for a lot of our oil. And by the way, do you know where a lot of the oil wells today are being sunk now that we've gotten even more ingenious? right out in the middle of nowhere in the water, Gulf of Mexico. 
because think of the fish that would have been destroyed. Remember this. How many of you know what happens whenever you drop uh, dynamite in water? You know what happens? All the, you kill all the fish, they all float to the top. You know that happens? you never done that as a boy, drop a cherry bomb in water and kill all the fish in that pond? Yeah, it's illegal to do. <laughs> Some of us did it anyway, though. Now, a firecracker won't work because it'll burn out, but you get something like a cherry bomb or a stick of dynamite or other ways that you can cause an explosion in water and you'll kill all the fish there. What about the fountains of the great deep breaking up? Genesis 7, 11. It would have killed all the fish that would have been around that fountain of the great deep that broke up. Would have killed billions of fish wherever those fountains broke up because that's just what happens. You don't want to be a fish in water. It destroys you whenever an explosion takes place in water. And so this is what they're doing now. They finally discovered, well, most of the oil is out there at the bottom of the ocean. We've just barely found any here on land. Most of it's out there at the bottom of the ocean. Why? That's where all the dead fish are. That's where all the fish remains are. And, of course, it would have taken hundreds of millions and billions again of fish in order to produce the remains that we have there. And they're just looking for oil everywhere. Where do they find it? Alaska. And build the Alaska pipeline to bring oil down from Alaska. There's nowhere where it's not. Maybe man hasn't dug deep enough in his neighborhood, but it seems to be just about everywhere. Now, there are certain pockets where you've got more than in other places, but in those great pockets, you have billions and billions of barrels of crude oil found there like what you have in Saudi Arabia, one of the richest countries in the world because of the millions and millions of barrels of crude oil that are exported from Saudi Arabia and from the other Persian Gulf states. Right off the coast of California now, Secretary Watts wanting to uh, auction off some of the land off the scenic California coast, and who wants to buy all that land out in the middle of the ocean? The oil companies want to. Exxon, Shell, Mobil, they want to buy all that land. Why? They've been reading Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9. <laughs> they know where they're going to find all that oil out there. Uh, I don't know about man ever running out of, of oil. He uses a lot of it, but in no way is, can that be compared to how many animals used to exist at one time. Do you realize that one half of all geologists in the world are employed directly by oil companies? That's what you do when you become a geologist. Half of all geologists in the world work for your major oil companies. That's what they need. They need your credentials for finding where that oil is hidden. And it's very rare whenever you really strike it big in oil. You see, back in the last century, uh, when we had all of these pockets that were rather shallow and that were rather close to the surface of the earth, it was no small thing whenever an individual struck oil in Oklahoma or Kansas or something like that, and you've got, you know, you've got that tremendous pressure that's built up there because it's locked there under pressure, which is what causes it to turn, by the way, into petroleum as we know it, and you've just got an explosion there. But most of those have been found today because they're, rare, they're pretty easy to find. But now they're having to go and look uh, other places, deeper places, far away places, cold places, hot places, wet places, in order to find it. But it's become one of the most important things of our whole world system. You realize what would happen if there were no petroleum barrels being shipped anywhere today? Things would just pretty much come to a stalemate. Now, I'm not saying that we're not going to run out of oil. I'm not going to say that we are. I have no idea. I'm not a geologist. I don't know where all the oil is, if there's any left or where it's found. But what I'm saying is this has become probably the most important thing in the 20th century for the whole world. You have to have oil. It runs everything. I mean, it's much more efficient than coal. Uh, solar energy, that's still in the closet, the experimental stage. Nuclear power, while well, they can barely get a station built today and they close it down for regulations on the plant. And you've got Three Mile Island accidents that scare everyone. And who wants, who wants a nuclear plant in your backyard? Only a fool would want a nuclear plant in your backyard. And, and that's why they're going to have to stick them out in the middle of nowhere 
No one wants them there. There are nuclear plants. We've got, well, more than 10 right here in this state. But a lot of them are being shut down today because the government has seen how hazardous they are. So what I'm saying is we're back to petroleum all over again. And we just can't seem to find all the petroleum that we need here in this country. We've got to export it from South America. We don't like to have to get it from Persian Gulf states. They put a squeeze on us in 73 that just about sent this country under because we were so dependent on Persian Gulf states. And as a result, you remember the gas lines of 73? Amen. You just would wait in line for hours to get a tank of gasoline. That's how important it's become. What are you going to do without a tank of gasoline? Well, we talked Sunday, you can always ride a bicycle, can't you? But most things, you see, are run in, in some measure, they've got to have gasoline. They've got to have that petroleum. And not only are things run with it, there are so many products paint and cosmetics everything from paint to cosmetics are made out of petroleum plastics are made out of petroleum now i won't get off into the subject on other things that go into ladies cosmetics but i will say one thing that uh it has been reported in more than one newspaper that aborted babies go into women's cosmetics and that's, that's not a hoax. That's actually true. That it's been reported in more than one case. What are you going to use that baby for? He's got a lot of oil in his body, a lot of good organs in his body. You can grind him up and heat him up and produce cosmetics out of it. Well, I don't have anything against cosmetics as such, but I don't know. That turns my stomach to think I'm putting abortive babies on whenever I wear cosmetics. Now, maybe the cosmetics you buy aren't made out of aborted babies, but some of them are being made. Because remember, just in the last 10 years since the legalization of abortion in this country, 10 million abortions in this country. And, of course, it was legal in Great Britain long before it was legal here. And just in the 10 years from 73 when it was legalized to 83, 10 million babies have been murdered in this country. You can get quite a few products from 10 million aborted children. That's tragic to think of. You don't think God's going to judge this country for murdering its children and turning them into cosmetics. There's never been a country more pagan than this country. Murder your own population and turn them into cosmetics. That's horrifying to think of. That is heinous to think of. This country is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. All they did was commit homosexual acts. Well, what's so bad about that? Everybody does that today. <laughs> not that it's not bad, but the point is, at least they didn't turn their children into cosmetics. They're only occasional cases where they cause them to walk through the fire remember that in the old testament that was the sacrifice of children but it's not like you cause all 10 million of them to walk through your village would die out lack of population then but with 220 240 million people here in this country we can afford 10 million then to go into cosmetics no telling what else is being done you see there are just a whole lot of things being done by our government being done by these huge super corporations of course one of the largest corporations in the world is one of the oil companies you know which one it is exxon one of the largest corporations in the world is exxon and exxon does just about everything they not only give you gas for your car they are into research for just about everything and so are most of these huge major world corporations that we have and these huge major banks like Citibank and Ch Chase Manhattan. They invest in all types of different and strange things. I'll tell you what, it's a sign of the times that we're in. It really is. Where we see our government doing, uh, I mean, really strange things. Not only did Hitler Nazi Germany do these things remember all the experiments he performed on people he would take a jew and plug him full of needles and find out how many needles it took stuck in his body before he bled to death and then mark that down in scientific statistics and burn their eyes with a match and find out how long they could live afterwards and all types of things like that 
And it uh, seems like that's the thing to do. If you run out of guinea pigs and little white rats, then you can go to Jews or maybe to you, Americans. I wouldn't be buying any of those U.S. savings bonds. That's investing in the government here. Investing in all, I don't care what type of return you get for U.S. savings bonds. I wouldn't be investing in those because no telling what the government's doing with that money that you invest in them. Well, let me give you another example concerning petroleum and how it has been formed in other ways today, which merely points to the validity of what we're saying concerning its formation by the flood. There was a recent experiment, again, I think back in the early 70s, where uh, this was a Bureau of the United States government experimenting on how to make petroleum, and they found out one way to make it. They heated cow manure to 716 degrees Fahrenheit under around two to 5,000 pounds of pressure per square inch for only 20 minutes in the presence of steam and carbon monoxide. Now this is cow manure heated to 716 degrees Fahrenheit under two to 5,000 pounds per square inch of pressure for 20 minutes, this is, I'm giving you the whole recipe, if you want to make any yourself, with steam and the presence of carbon monoxide, and they produce three barrels of oil per ton of cow manure. Three barrels of oil per ton of cow manure. Now, of course, that particular part of the cow what he puts off from himself is rather fertile but it's not as oily and as fertile as the whole cow himself so what I'm saying is if they could have gotten three barrels of oil from only a ton now a ton is just a couple of thousand pounds a ton is not very much if they could have gotten three barrels of oil from one ton of cow manure then how many barrels of oil could you have gotten from all the animals take away the plants that weighed at least half of what the planet Earth weighs, then how many barrels of oils do you think could be produced? Not billions. We're up into the trillions of barrels of crude oil that are still out there to be discovered. God had all of this already foreseen, that old wicked man was going to get to the place. He was so busy doing things, so intelligent inventing things, so busy going places, that he was going to be looking for this new source of energy, two new sources, and sure enough, he found them. First of all, he found coal, he found out what to do with that, and secondly, he found petroleum, and he's found at least a few things to do with that. There's no end to what man in his lost, fallen, perverted mind will do. But he's already foreseen all this. None of this, remember, was provided in creation. It was all provided since the time of creation, all because of the flood. Well, I think we'll stop there for tonight. Went longer than we went, meant to, but we still have quite a few things to cover. Do you have any explanation of why the oil is in pockets and it's usually together pretty much? Okay. He's asking, why is the oil found in pockets? And uh, generally it's found in a pocket together where you've got several hundred million barrels or where you only have several thousand barrels. I forget what the figures are concerning how rare it is whenever you really strike something that gives you several hundred million barrels. But there you drill many wildcat wells before you ever really strike it big. Well, the thing is that just like with coal, it takes the right temperature, it takes the right time, and more than anything else, it takes the right pressure in order to form this. And if you get oil just spread out all over the place, you're not going to have it confined in a small enough space to put pressure on it like you will if you find it in a pocket. And, of course, that's right. Oil is always found in pockets. 
And it's not found above that, it's not found be beneath that, and it's not found outside the borders on the sides of the pocket. It's only found in that one pocket, even if there are hundreds of millions of barrels there. But it has to be in some isolated location in order for pressure to be put on the remains of those animals, all of which were buried in that particular place, so that petroleum could be the final product. You see, the flood would have just carried plants and animals just at random different places. But there's so many of them, you couldn't help but end up with, you know, several million dinosaurs that got buried in one place together. Or several million palm trees that got buried in one place together. So it was at random where these things were taken. But when you got enough of the plants together, maybe you only got, you know, a few plants in one place. Well, no coal is going to be produced then. And if you've got just one dinosaur in one place, then no oil. Practically none. I mean, if it produced uh, a can of oil, no one's ever going to find a can or a cup of oil. You're going to have to have a lot of animals or plants there. And when they happen to get in the right area, then you end up with your coal and with your petroleum. Any other questions on the whole subject? You've probably never thought of that whenever you're pumping gas into your car. Where did that gas come from? What's gasoline made of? It's made of the remains of mammals, for the most part, because that's where we get our huge dinosaurs in the past, and from the trillions of human beings that were on the earth. So you remember that. I doubt any of you thought of that. You remember that whenever you put gas into your car. You're putting prehistoric, by that we mean back prior to when records were kept of how big people were and how fast animals could run. You're putting the remains of prehistoric men and prehistoric animals to work for you. Might as well put them to work for you. They don't do any good just laying out there all that, what they call black gold. Gold, gold is one thing, but you have a lot of black gold and you'll be richer than gold, gold, because you can't do anything with gold. All gold is, all, only reason gold is a precious metal is because it's rare. That's the only thing that makes a precious metal a precious one. If you only had three pieces of bark in the world, they would be very expensive because they'd be rare. But you've got bark, leaves, grass everywhere. It's not rare, so it's not expensive. But, but you can't do anything with gold, gold, but black gold you can. Yes, you have a question? What goes into the steam when the oil's gone? What goes into the hole? Well, see, generally to get oil out, you have to pump water in. And you see, oil rises to the top. And you have to pump. You've got to get pressure down there to get it to come out and to get it to all come out and then have something fill up there. Then your whole well is going to collapse down. So you generally, to get oil out of the ground, you pump water in the ground. You pump it down one shaft and the oil comes up another one. It doesn't matter if you fill the whole pool full of water. Water and oil can't mix. Oil always comes to the top. Oil always separates itself. So you just fill that whole thing up with water. And then, of course, rather than having a cavity now with two barrels of oil, you've got a cavity with four barrels, two of oil, two of water, and it can't hold that much. Something's got to come out then. And oil's what does. Is the, uh, the top 20% of a cavity usually natural gas, too? That's true. That's true. Natural gas is generally found in the same place. Again, um, what happens whenever you have an, uh, an animal today die and you keep him protected from predators, he begins to put off an odor. And uh, odor and a gas aren't much different from each other. All the remains are the same thing. But one you've got uh, in the remains of a liquid, the other you have in the remains of gas.
before he 